Great. Good evening, everyone, and uh, and welcome to this um, special meeting uh, on connecting the North, leveling up transport. It's a joint parliamentary for forum. Um, I I've been asked to chair this uh, this session in the in the um, in, in the absence of Andrew Gwynn, who who couldn't be with us sadly. So um, I I'll just sort of quickly give an overview in terms of what we're trying to achieve this evening. In response to the integrated rail plan, the IRP, and the levelling up white paper, Greater Manchester, Liverpool City region, West Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, North of Tyne, North East, East, East Tees Valley, Cumbria and Lancashire MPs and peers, along with key stakeholders from across the transport industry, are coming together to look at connecting the North and what is needed to level up Northern transport. Um, the session will aim to build a pan-northern political consensus on how to build back better transport and connect our cities, towns and communities across the north. In particular, it will look at how we deliver faster, greener, more reliable, accessible and affordable journeys to improve east-west connectivity. Integrated transport plans and connectivity need to be at the heart of the government's levelling up agenda for the north and arguably without the northern powerhouse rail and the eastern leg of HS, HS2 on the table, there is a significant gap. The session will provide an opportunity for MPs and peers of all parties from across the north to come together with a view to urging the government to level up transport connectivity where it can best deliver the maximum economic impact for the region, but also for the country as a whole. This initial parliamentary meeting will bring together not just Greater Manchester MPs and peers, but those from other transport related and regional and city region APPGs in the north. Uh, I myself chair the all party group for rail in the north. The session will act as a sounding board and will provide a forum to have an initial discussion to see how and if we can join forces to create a collaborative and genuine cross party northern voice on leveling up, leveling up northern transport. This joint parliamentary forum is designed for parliamentarians and industry leaders to discuss the key issues, exchange views, and to be briefed about what's going on. And the, the session should be interactive and endeavor to bring in as many voices as possible to generate the debate. Um, the session will have two panels. Uh, the first panel will include Martin Tugwell, CEO of Transport for the North, Henry, Henry Murison, Director of the Northern Powers Partnership, Lorna Pimlot from HS2, and Tobin Hughes, Managing Director, Transport Northeast. And the second panel will uh, it, it include <laughs> Councillor Susan Hinchcliffe, Leader of Bradford Council, uh, Councillor Bev Craig, Leader of Manchester Council, Lord Inglewood, Chair of Cumbria Local Enterprise Partnership, and Councillor Liam Robinson, Transport Portfolio, Portfolio Holder for the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. And then there'll be an opportunity for an open panel discussion. So we'll get straight on. And our first panel, Connecting the North. And uh, first of all, I think Martin Tugwell is going to kick off on that. Martin, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And, and it's uh, great to be able to join um, this, this conversation because I think it's, uh, it's a timely one. And um, it's one that we're having the opportunity to talk with parliamentarians and having their uh, support for what we're doing, I think is really important. Um, just to remind people that uh, Transport for the North, it's a statutory body, it's uh, the subnational transport body. So we were set up uh, to set out the longer term uh, vision and ambition for the North transport system. Um, and when doing that, um, we did very much, we, it was very much grounded in an understanding of what the economic opportunities are across the, the North. And it was very much shaped by the input from the Northern Powerhouse Inter Independent uh, Economic <laughs> Review that fed into the strategic transport plan. And that showed how um, important it is to transform the North transport system if we are to realize its economic potential. And at the time we published the strategic transport plan, we were setting out how the ambition of the North was to realize 100 billion pounds extra in terms of GVA, 850,000 jobs. So really strong uh, linkage between the investment in transport and delivery of economics. Since then, of course, we've seen um, more work being done around things like regional decarbonisation, and the rail network has a key role to play 
in actually providing uh, solutions <laughs> to the decarbonisation challenge. And of course, we mustn't forget the social dimension either as well, Pierre, because a lot of the population, particularly in our larger cities, um, they, they're actually the, 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 the non-car owning population is very significant. So if we're going to provide people with opportunities to address the barriers in terms of social exclusion, then having good quality, reliable, efficient uh, public transport is really important moving forward. So all of that kind of reinforces the importance of why making the investment in infrastructure and particularly the rail infrastructure and services as a transformational change. And, and of course, what we're seeing, um, it's worth being aware that what we're seeing in the short term is the pressure on our existing um, largely Victorian two-track railway uh, coming back um, uh, you know, almost consistently now. The return to the rail network in the north has been uh, uh, ahead of the national average, ahead of uh, the, the return in other parts of the country, um, both in terms of passenger and indeed in terms of freight. Uh, and if we think about um, the opportunities here, in, we mustn't forget that investment in uh, Northern Powerhouse Rail and delivery of the IRP is as much about freight as it is much about um, passengers. And of course, the fact that we've got these pressures coming back um, tells us that it's not just about speed when we're looking for investment, it's about capacity, it's about using the investment that we've got uh, identified as a catalyst for growth and an opportunity to affect change in terms of the way people travel. So if we kind of take a, a glass half full um, uh, perspective, then having had the publication of the Integrated Rail Plan, then there is an opportunity because we have in effect got a, uh, an undertaking from the, the, from the Treasury to make this kind of investment in the North. What we've got to make sure is we've got to make sure that the investment we make is actually delivering on the outcomes and the ambition that we're looking for. And we know that there are areas and aspects of the integrated rail plan where there is a, there's a need to do more work. And certainly uh, as TFN, and uh, although our role has changed from being co-client to co-sponsor, we're committed to making sure that we use and harness the tools and the techniques that we've got to support making the case for actually delivering uh, the businesses, uh, the business case and the investment. Um, in doing that, I think it's important just to remember that um, where we have large infrastructure projects, they do evolve over time. So if we think about what was originally announced in terms of HS2, for example, um, it has evolved as a project over time. And I think that's why we need to see the commitment from Treasury to underwrite the cost of the investment in the North as an opportunity. And then we use the opportunity to shape how we deliver that. But at the same time, not forgetting there are issues we still need to address, issues where we still re require to develop a solution that is affordable and deliverable. And I think here, particularly about um, recent uh, comment from uh, Andrew Stevenson MP, where he was setting out his, uh, his commitment to, or his desire to see uh, HS2 still arrive in Leeds. This is an opportunity for us to work together to make the case for that investment and to make some progress about identifying how we so, so, uh, solve those problems. Because the challenges in these places, um, for example, Leeds, it is the third it is the third largest source of delay on the entire national rail network after Clapham Junction and after uh, Birmingham. So the need to address these problems and to provide the scope for growth remains. We need though to work together to find out how we have a, an affordable solutions. Other areas where we need to work together that aren't um, totally resolved through the integrated rail plan, access to the Humber ports, access to Hull, where the connections to free ports, global gateways, and connecting them across uh, the north to the global gateways on the western coast in places like Liverpool. These remain challenges that we need to address. And we need to work together, use the foundation we've got to make the case for the investment that will deliver that step change in terms of not just speed, as I said, but also capacity. And, and I'm sure that we'll touch a little bit later as well about there are challenges around, uh, um, around the East Coast Corridor, where um, there are some opportunities through the IRP, but we also know that there are longer term opportunities linked with things like the Leamside Line, 
where that's not only about supporting economic opportunities in the region itself, but it's also contributing to the bigger picture. So I think it's, it's a starting point. The need for the transformational investment is very clear in the uh, strategic transport plan. We've got an opportunity with what has been announced through the IRP, and we need to use the opportunity to make the case to refine the proposals, to shape the delivery, to make sure it's consistent with our long-term ambitions. But we mustn't lose the fact that we need to still address some of those issues that have yet to be addressed by the IRP, of which I've mentioned a few. So I think it's a foundation, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think that's why um, this conversation is so important. But maybe at this point, perhaps I can turn to Henry Murison, who's the director of Northern Powerhouse Partnership, because I think this economic foundation is so important. And Henry, I know the work of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership has been instrumental in this. So maybe, maybe give you an opportunity just to reflect a little bit yourself about what the IRP means for the North. I think that's, I mean, I think it's a really good introduction, Martin, and thanks so much for bringing me into the discussion. Um, I, I think the, the reflection I would give is that that we have to, to make sure we deliver what has been committed to without forgetting what the greater whole is, if that makes sense. Because um, even in the case of Bradford, we'll hear later from Susan, the economic opportunity where I'm sitting and, and she's sitting has been undervalued by Treasury, but there is still some investment, right, in the, in the plans that were announced. And, and all that the IRP really is, is a shopping list for government of things it might potentially buy in the future, um, and a, a not particularly well prioritised one. And that leaves an awful lot of wiggle room for government to not deliver what it said it wants to do, which is things at pace. Because the economic rationale of, of schemes like the, the whole electrification that you mentioned, Martin, is that they were deliverable more quickly. And ironically, some of those have been lost uh, now, at least in the temporary kind of hiatus we're in, um, and, and may not necessarily come back, but we hope they will. And I think the, the economic underpinning for those was that it is about the wider economic geography of the north of England being more productive. So the, the fundamental thing that Treasury, in their approach to the IRP, missed out was that this wasn't about addressing existing transport issues. It never was about that for MPP, at least. And it was never about that in the MPIR that you referenced, Martin. It was always about creating that larger labour market, which would have the higher levels of productivity we want for the north of England. Um, and uh, I think in this discussion, Chair, I think reflecting on, on how it looks from, from Gateshead, how it looks from many parts of the north of England that have uh, not necessarily fared as well as they could have done post deindustrialization despite the efforts of, of the local public sector and local councils in particular. The, the, what we want is the same opportunities that, for instance, have existed in Manchester for a number of years to be able to be replicated. And, and I think the, the fundamental challenge, I think, that we, we haven't yet got to the bottom of is how we're going to unlock the economic growth that we know exists across the north of England if we still have uh, relatively poor transport connectivity genuinely on that, that east-west corridor and also connecting the northeast into to West Yorkshire and on to Greater Manchester yeah. and Liverpool. Um, and whether it be the lost international connectivity benefits from Manchester Airport around a global hub, the ability to, to leverage more long-haul connectivity for the north uh, collectively, whether it be some of the issues we're now going to experience, I think, around the deliverability of this project. All of that, I think, is, is the, the questions that remain unresolved, Martin. And I think if we look at them from an economic lens, as you suggest, rather than just through the kind of, you said, and we, we experienced cuts angle, which obviously uh, very much in the initial aftermath was the way we all had to focus, I think, in terms of our efforts. What we need to do is, is push forward the other elements of the MPIR. So the elements around innovation, around industrial strategy, around education and skills, to make the point that actually, if you're gonna achieve genuine leveling up across the North of England, you need to pursue transport alongside those other objectives. Um, and certainly the work that I know many of the combined authorities have been doing through devolution, those areas that are still seeking devolution deals, that indicates the level of commitment to that wider thinking within the MPIR. Because the more you push on the other productivity drivers, you do create more of a case for actually driving on transport. Because if you can demonstrate that the scale of the prize, that the overall economic opportunity is, is more significant than otherwise thought, I think that does, does start to change minds in, in government. And certainly the commitment of the private sector to working collectively, both with yourself and, and colleagues across the north of England, to bring forward private 
and uh, funding options as well as financing options is absolutely on the table. And I think in a number of cases where there are strong opportunities still on the table, uh, the IRP should be seen as a sort of a potential government shopping list. But there are other things that the North of England may want to do collectively. And absolutely, we should continue to collaborate on that basis. And certainly, the, the business leaders in the North of England I work with closely uh, feel very acutely the economic benefits that the full uh, NPR network would bring alongside the full Eastern leg of HS2. And having seen both uh, really constrained in terms of ambition uh, in the IRP, all very keen to identify and make sure that whether it's the question of Leeds Station, whether it's the question of how you get HS2 trains to Leeds, whether it's the question of how you improve connectivity and capacity in the North East, whether it's the question, as I'm sure Liam will address, of how you ensure Liverpool gets the maximum benefits of both the Western leg of HS2 and of NPR and that new line as far as Warrington to maximise the value of that investment, uh, we will continue to work on those issues to make sure that we get, in the end, a, an actual service specification we can all live with. Because what we don't have in the IRP is even an indication of what these kind of journey time assumptions and hopes actually equate to in terms of actual specification. And on questions like the hull electrification that we've just alluded to, uh, both of us, Martin, there isn't a way to deliver a, a train service pattern that doesn't have an electrified line uh, because you need somewhere to send all these electric trains flying across the Pennines onto, if that makes sense. Uh, there won't be enough capacity, even with Leamside, to send them all to the northeast. Um, so there's lots of unanswered questions about what the IRP might actually ever equate to. And what we've got to keep focusing on is the economic drivers for why we were doing it in the first place. So that at every decision that might be made by this government to implement it or by future governments to maybe approach it slightly differently, we're still guided by the fundamental economic case for why it's so necessary. Presumably, Henry, that's also why you, you, you touched on in your in your comments there about the levelling up agenda. And I think that's, is it kind of fair to say that it's important to see, as you said, in the context of a wider um, coordinated approach, which which tackles the which helps delivers the outcomes that we're looking, which are both focused around the individual, the places they live, and and some of those outcomes around social, environmental, and economic outcomes. Is that that's the opportunity with the leveling up white paper? Do you think? I think I think the opportunity, isn't it, is to is to to join up the economic realities with some of the aspirations about about what it will look and feel like for people, because um, I think. What, what is slightly missing from the, the white paper is an understanding of the economic prize that you, you deliver through a rebalanced economy. So it's, of course, there are social benefits to uh, wider investment, but also that economic prize is not insignificant, Martin. And I think, I think that my, my critique of, of the white paper, if I have one, is that the level of spending ambition to close certainly the north-south divide in its most kind of kind of obvious sense in terms of the, the gap in incomes which is highlighted in the MPAR is a is a very significant driver for wider economic and social change. So there is the health inequalities challenges in, in West Yorkshire where I'm sitting or in the northeast cannot be addressed unless there is more income coming into households in those places. Um, simply better quality public services, however valuable they might be, will not address the fundamental issues that exist in some of our places. And um, I think sometimes the government has sort of said it wants to address these social ills, has committed itself to doing that, but isn't necessarily understanding the very significant private sector investment they're going to have to leverage to achieve that. And yeah. without commitment from the private sector uh, to invest alongside the public sector, without that underpinning investment, particularly in education and skills and transport that really largely only the public sector can can drive i do worry that many of the things in the leveling up white paper are not achievable uh, because as laudable as the aims might be the current levels of devolution and transport investment we've got and investment in those wider drives of productivity are not enough to deliver the mpir outcomes of yeah. the, the significant uplift in productivity and what comes with that in terms of the social and economic opportunities that will be opened up in the north of England if you did achieve what, what's set out in the MPIR. So it comes back again to the, the, the key role that transformational investment in infrastructure has in realising the economic opportunity. I wonder if that's an opportunity just to maybe invite um, 
Lorna Pimlock to come on from from HS2. Um, Lorna, and obviously, um, as as HS2, you're 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 part of uh, delivering uh, um, some of the infrastructure. So it's probably it, it, uh, are you able to kind of give us an update or a, 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 a sort of a, a, an update on where you are uh, as an organisation? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, um, Martin, and thank you very much for inviting me to to join. I thought I was attending till yesterday rather than presenting. So um, I'm, we're very grateful for uh, being able to join. So yeah, exciting times for HS2. Um, I think for the first time ever since uh, January, I'm able to say that we actually have three phases of HS2 now underway and you know, a real momentum. So we have you know, London to the West Midlands, which is phase one, which um, is under construction and, and has been under construction for quite some time now. Um, we've got the West Midlands to crew, so phase 2A, which we received our Royal Ascent last year, last February, and we're sort of transitioning now into construction for that, so a lot of procurements underway. Um, and then for the Western leg, we actually deposited our Parliament, the second largest bill ever in Parliament, on the 24th of January. So really that, that is progress from where we sit in HS2. And I'm you know, very pleased to be able to share that. And you know, we've got now over 20,000 in our workforce across the UK, supporting all the various procurements and contracts that we've got in the market. We've got thousands of, of companies that we're working with. A, a large percentage of them are SMEs. So, you know, the, the focus of HS2 has always been what we, the country can, can gain from the project. It's, it's not just about the, the, the tracks and the trains, albeit a very key priority. Um, we've got our environmental statement consultation for 2B open till the 31st of March and the impact assessment for that. So again, I would stress, please do uh, respond to that consultation. That is there to address um, concerns that may be raised uh, on, the, on the 2B route in particular. And I think the other thing I would really like to stress is, you know, the, the, the point of HS2 has largely been around opportunity and investment, and that is countrywide. So very much bringing to the North new investment, new jobs, new new opportunities new housing and we've been working with all the regions very closely on their growth strategies to ensure that we can maximize those opportunities and in particular you know the manchester region and local authorities we're working very closely with them hs2 for me is three c's so we've got connectivity we've got capacity which martin you've already right ready touched on that you know absolutely key to HS2 is that we will bring sort of 2 billion extra travel miles a year. Um, and then the last C is, is carbon reduction. You know, absolutely now more than ever, contributing to getting lorries and cars off the road uh, and being able to utilize greater freight opportunities because we are giving um, the network more opportunity for that is key to what HS2 is really about. And I think it's you know, also really tapping into the fact that reducing aviation, um, HS2 from city to city will actually be able to um, take on that market as well and, and realistically compete. Whereas I think in the past, rail has, has tr struggled to perhaps do that. So I think those are the main things I would say really hopefully contribute to the discussion this afternoon. Um, and as I say, I think IRP, although there may be, uh, there was lots of aspects of different projects and the integration of them, which is absolutely so key. So again, MPR and HS2, working hand in hand, in fact, sharing infrastructure to make sure that we bring to Manchester and we bring to the North the opportunities that they so deserve. And that's it for me. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Lorna. I, I'm, I'm, there'll be an opportunity just to pick up on a few points that are being made in, in the chat in the moment, but I'm just wondering, gonna, if I might, just turn, turn and invite uh, Tobin Hughes to come in next, um, um, because obviously, there's been a lot of discussion and understandably around um, the importance of connecting across the Pennines, but fundamentally as well, the Northern Powerhouse Rail proposal was about connecting, uh, improving connectivity in the round, north, south, as well as east, west. And 
Tobin, you're working from your part of the world. Um, though that kind of wider connectivity, I guess, is really quite important. But um, maybe an opportunity for you just to kind of reflect upon what it means for you. Yes, thank you, Martin, and thank you, Chair, for the invitation to address the group. It's a great opportunity. Uh, and hello again, Lorna. Uh, it's just a shame that we won't be, as a northeast region, working with you very much in the future, which is something I'm sure that uh, Susan Hinchcliffe will share um, when she comes on to speak later on. But um, yeah, it, starting with the economic side of things, well, in, in the northeast, we were very excited by the vision of northern economic growth that was set out in the original plans um, that Transport for the North had. The 100 billion pound GVA growth and uh, our share of 850,000 new jobs across the North that were set out in the economic review. Um, and our region knows all too well how good rail services can support the um, employment, education, healthy and active lifestyles, the economy. And that's because we have luckily an excellent and efficient local commuter network. Um, in the form of the Tyne and Weir Metro, which fortunately we own and operate. Um, but when it comes to long distance rail links, unfortunately we suffer from a chronic capacity bottleneck. Perhaps um, not the ones that you named earlier, but certainly up there in terms of causes of delay and disruption across the country, uh, as many people who use it will have experienced. Um, and this is on the East Coast Main Line, which as you've said before, it's the rail route that links the northeast to pretty much all of the other parts of the UK. So it causes daily congestion and unreliability, not just in our region, but fanning out across the country. And it places a limit on the number of passenger and freight trains that can serve our region. And that limit has already been reached. And that, of course, limits future economic growth. So we enthusiastically embraced the Northern Powerhouse Rail Scheme the transport for the North developed on behalf of all Northern partners, because it was a means of getting the investment that was needed to solve this capacity problem once and for all. And part of it certainly involved reopening a parallel disused rail route that, was, that is called the Leamside Line, because through that we could divert freight and slow local passenger trains away from the East Coast Main Line, which itself would be upgraded and reserved for those high speed services to use uninterrupted, a massive capacity benefit um, on behalf of the whole country. And then coupled with HS2's Eastern Leg and the Northern Powerhouse Rail investments across the Pennines, our physical and economic links to London, the Midlands, and crucially, all of the other Northern cities would have been utterly transformed, both in frequency and in speed. And Bradford would have been added to the network opportunity as well. Um, but it would have taken an hour to reach Leeds and 90 minutes to get to Manchester. That's a whole hour less than the current journey time. And so it's plain for all to see that this plan would help to unlock the North East's economic potential, uh, making it easier for people and goods to move to, from and through our region. It would have made it much easier for companies to move to the North East in order to access our fantastic quality of life. So helping to increase that all important number of higher skilled jobs, which has been referred to already. Um, and it would have enhanced massively our region's competitivity as a result. And it does lag behind other parts of England. So it's fair to say that the IRP's publication when it came was something of a disappointment in our region and uh, widely received as such, because uh, we now know that HS2's Eastern Leg will not be built certainly not in the form that was originally envisaged. Uh, and so the Northeast will not be connected to HS2 at all. Um, and Northern Powerhouse Rail, whilst it's alive in some form, it's massively reduced in scope to some short stretches of new line and upgrades to the existing Trans-Pennine route. Uh, so links to the rest of the North will, it's true, they will be better um, than today once all of the construction is complete, but they will be a lot slower than we would like there are some positives. The IRP does complain, contain a plan to ease the bottleneck on the East Coast Main Line in our region, and that will help both reliability and growth, although not by reopening the lean side line as we would like. There may also be an improved level of service to some cities 
ushered in by IRP investments elsewhere in due course. Uh, as a region, we still intend to take the Leamside line forward as a locally driven initiative, given that it can still unlock massive opportunities for housing, jobs, and moving local trips from car to rail. And I have to say, this is a plan that's supported by all of our region's MPs, which is good to see. So to conclude, although the IRP isn't exactly what we wanted, we do want to move forward positively. Um, we will be working, of course, with the government, with Great British Railways as it forms, with Transport for the North, and with partners across the North, um, public and private sector, so that we can start to unlock that really important capacity, connectivity, and the associated economic growth that the North East so desperately needs, and so do all of the other parts of the North as well. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. I, I was just going to, just looking at some of the questions being raised in the chat. I just wonder, um, and Lorna, I don't know whether you're in a position to kind of make some comment. It may be but because it's part of the bill, um, you're, you're not in a position, but there was a comment or a question about private sector investment and in particular related to opportunities perhaps around Manchester Airport, whether, whether you're in a position to say anything about that or whether because it's a bill, that's something that needs to be debated by Parliament. But while you're kind of just thinking about that, can maybe I put Henry on notice that I'll come to him then about this general point about how can we um, use some of this to um, to, to the, the opportunity to, to to look for the private sector to work with us. Lorna, are you able to comment about the uh, the role of private sector investment with HS2? Um, for for procurement, probably probably not as much as for hybrid bill. Um, I think that our, we, we do a great deal with our supply chain for opportunities, but we also do a lot with the region with regards to the opportunity for, for growth and growth strategies. So I think the private sector will undoubtedly get more opportunities from the Department of Leveling Up, for example, and the work that they're going to do to try and, again, optimise the opportunities HS2 coming to the region will bring. Um, but more specifically than that, no, I can't really at this point. Sorry, Martin. No, that, that's fine. I, I thought that might be the case, Laura, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity. Maybe can I just maybe then look to Henry, because I think there is this point about how do we um, use the opportunities with where we have got public sector investment coming in? Are there are there things that we could do to maybe leverage in more from the private sector? I think you mentioned a little bit about maybe the access to, to the Humber area and the whole routes, but more generally, this point about the relationship with the private sector. So I think, I mean, as, as I alluded to, I think there, there is, it's very hard to see how there's a way to, to fill the gap in investment. I think it's 36 billion of cuts we calculated. Uh, and, and Tim, at your end agrees, so I think our maths is right. You're, it's very difficult to fill that sort of gap uh, when you consider that the uplift opportunities are, are, are less significant. Um, because this is is national infrastructure that does have some local benefits, but the benefits largely accrue to people often quite some distance away from the stations. Uh, so it's not, for instance, like Crossrail or, or comparable directly to, say, the Hong Kong uh, metro system, to think of ways that, that private money has been used in the past in other parts of the world. I think my kind of, my, my, my focus would be saying that where there are chances to, to do some additional investment, beyond the IRP envelope, we should absolutely try and do those in any way possible. And I, my, my basic position is uh, that we need to continue to demonstrate to the government where the door has been left open, that certain projects should proceed on some sort of basis. So hull electrification isn't ruled out in the IRP, it just isn't ruled in. There are other things like uh, a new station in Bradford, which for some reason the Treasury has explicitly said it doesn't want to pay for itself, uh, despite the fact that if you're building a new electrified line or improving significantly the line to Leeds, um, I don't really know what benefits you'll get for ongoing connectivity if it's all leading to the same station. So I think my kind of my underlying view would be in each case, there almost needs to be a case by case discussion, Martin. Um, and I think my regret would be um, there were a number of us pre IRP uh, during the development of, of, of NPR who were very keen to explore different funding mechanisms. And there was perhaps a lack of consensus around the North that that was a good idea. I think we do need to look ourselves in the mirror and think we shouldn't have been going into this discussion saying to Treasury, we want this big load of money and we're not prepared to put anything in. 
um, or raise anything from alternative sources, I think that was a mistake, actually. Uh, and I think we need to kind of own up to it collectively that we all should have made a different proposition to government. But I think if we don't learn those lessons, we're not going to get it right next time. And, and I think that uh, we already were right uh, on the hook potentially uh, for paying for uh, an HS2 station in, in Manchester already uh, in terms of GM colleagues or making some sort of contribution. So the idea of making a contribution is not a new one. And um, I think what, what we need to do is actually come up with the right solutions that are in the interests of the local investor community and the public sector locally, not just central government. And that more grown up conversation is much easier to have when uh, it isn't just treasury money that's being talked about. Um, and I think uh, certainly if you compare us to how our colleagues in London have approached investment, uh, people often make the comparison on, about the unfairness and that's absolutely true. But we also haven't been as willing to be as entrepreneurial as say TfL have been in the last two decades. And for all of us involved, that's a chance to, to learn a lesson. And, and I think certainly on our end, we, we've been prepared to take our share of that, that need to, to make a different change going forward in terms of how we, we think about how we present the case we want to make. Thanks, Henry. I, I'll hand back to the chair in a moment, just kind of just, um, just to kind of build on that, just to remind people that one of the things that um, TFN has as a regional center of excellence is this modeling and this analysis capability which actually allows us to put start to put some numbers around some of those opportunities i think henry and that's one of the things that tfn uh, and our modeling team i'm really committed to making sure we see if we can work with government and the private sector to kind of identify those opportunities and harness them and i think uh, just one final point from me reflecting on the comments about we're talking a lot about rail here and the importance of the strategic road network and the bus and the coach network and really just to emphasize that the strategic transport plan um, makes those kind of whole system approaches to transport, but it really does highlight the, the key transformational role that the, uh, that the that transformation and investment in the rail network makes uh, available for other things to be done. Um, Chair, I'm sorry, we've just run over a little bit on that time for the panel, but can I hand back to you to, to maybe introduce the, the second panel, but thanks to everybody who's contributed to so far. Thanks very much indeed, Martin, and, and thank you to, to the to the panel uh, for, for that uh, set, set of contributions. And I, I think, from from my perspective, uh, a, a, a lot of um, a, a lot of meat grain there, as it were. And um, colleagues will probably not be aware, but I did actually have personal investment in EHS two, having spent fifteen months on the hybrid bill committee for four days a week. So. Um, uh, it, it, you know that it, 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 I, I did hope to get something out of it in the end, um, and I don't mean a knighthood. I, I, what I meant was the con connection to the northeast of England. Um, so, so, and that that wasn't to be. But I, I still can't help but but remember that when HS2 was first announced, Patrick McLaughlin stood at the dispatch box and promised me I would be able to travel on an HS2 train um, from Newcastle to Houston in two hours and 20 minutes. Uh, and that was a promise that he made. Having said that, by the way, uh, 20 years ago, I could travel from Newcastle to King's Cross in two hours, 40 minutes. So something like 40 years might have elapsed and we would have saved 20 minutes on the journey. But it's not just about a, a journey time, it's about capacity. And I just can't help but news that we're having huge debates, particularly on the East Coast corridor about uh, LNER's proposed timetable and if we had some additional capacity north of York, we, we wouldn't have to have those debates because that's, that's, that's the sticking point there. It's that capacity issue, particularly north of York, which is causing all of the problems in terms of having to change everyone's timetables, not just LNARs. So moving on swiftly now to the second panel, um, we have with us, uh, Councillor Susan Hinchcliffe, who's leader of Bradford City Council, Councillor Bev Craig, leader of Manchester City Council, Lord Inglewood, who's chair of the Cumbria Local Enterprise Partnership, and Councillor Liam Robinson, transport portfolio, portfolio, portfolio holder for the Liverpool City Region uh, Combined Authority. And um, I, I think, Susan, you're going to kind of act in a similar sort of way and uh, sort of kick off that. And, 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 and then, if you don't mind, I'll chair with. Through the, through the rest of the presentations. So Susan, over to you, please. 
Thank you very much and thanks for having me. I'm particularly delighted to be uh, a West Yorkshire person in a Greater Manchester APPG, can I say. Uh, and I snapped at the opportunity to speak here because the IRP um, treats us all as independent separate city regions rather than seeing the connectivity that we need across the north. And what Bradford needs recognising from the national government is that yes, we need better connectivity to Leeds, but actually that connection to Manchester and Liverpool is also absolutely vital for us. And when I, I, I lead a global city, 153 languages spoken, and when my residents say to me, Susan, I'm going to pick up my uncle from the airport, they don't mean Leeds Bradford, I'm afraid, they do mean Manchester Airport, which means they're going to get into a car and travel on the M62 over to Manchester Airport. Uh, and on the train, there's no direct train to Manchester Airport from Bradford. So it is a massive carbon commitment that we're um, providing, I'm afraid. And that's why we're all having to have clean air zones, isn't it? Because 74% of the journeys between Leeds and Bradford alone are done in the car. So those are kind of challenges that we're really tackling. And, and the IRP, obviously, I was incredibly disappointed about the IRP and still am. I, I, I try to be a glass half full person. So what I can see in the IRP for West Yorkshire is obviously TRU. So we needed that transparent upgrade. Uh, and that's, you know, we needed it 10 years ago, but in full, we welcome that. It's really important for us. Um, but, uh, and we also got uh, Bradford to Leeds electrification. I said, 12 minute journey time they said they'll deliver i'm not sure it's okay it's possible actually in what they've set out but you know willing to work with that and there's some money in the budget to deliver that but what we missed out massively was a northern powerhouse rail and it was a commitment between a new line between leeds and manchester that never happened and that was made to us several times and of course hs2 into leeds uh, and all leeds is regeneration plans are predicated on the south of the city being regenerated around a new station. The land is already there, it's already assembled for uh, regeneration and now you know, very disappointing that uh, government have not said yes to that. We don't accept no as an answer though in West Yorkshire. So Leeds, uh, Bradford and uh, a whole of West Yorkshire and Tracy Brabin are there. We're still battling away on that. And we will make the business case, that actually the money that's set aside could be better spent on delivering the plans that we know would work. So um, for us, IRP and trains, I don't know an awful lot about trains. Actually, I spend a lot of my time talking about them, don't know an awful lot about them. But I do know it's about regeneration for me. Uh, and our regeneration plans for our city were modelled around a new station in Bradford City Centre, which would have also helped electrify the Calder Valley line. Um, and um, when government ministers say, well, you know, you know, the capacity journey times, they completely miss out the economic benefits that are massively underestimated from new transport infrastructure. Uh, and when they talk about regeneration, they don't realise it leads to better health. I do believe that for want of better transport infrastructure, we have had people die earlier than they should have done in this country. And I think it's really important that remember to get better jobs and better health, you do need good transport. It's not to say it's everything, you need better skills as well, but transport is a major economic driver. Um, I noticed in the chat, somebody said about active travel being important as well. It is, it's an and and, not an and or. Um, so we're massively behind in our investment in this country and infrastructure, and we need to get on, on top of that. Um, and finally, I'd just say that um, the IRP, whatever comes out of that, I think we all need to be mindful, and government particularly needs to be mindful, not to deliver things which preclude our ambitions for the future. So that Manchester to Bradford link is absolutely vital for us. I might not be able to deliver it in my lifetime, but I wouldn't want to stop somebody else delivering it in another lifetime of another generation of politicians. So don't build the Manchester station the wrong way around, for example, so you can never get that uh, east-west connectivity. So let's be my... Ian, you talk about it being hybrid bills. It's the work in that committee that is going to make sure that we don't make mistakes now with this down payment on investment to stop the future happening. So um, that's uh, I'll pause there. Thank you very much. Susan, thank you very much indeed. And moving swiftly on to Councillor Bev Craig from Manchester City Council. Uh, Bev, are you there, please? I am in, yes. Yeah. I'll just let the technology catch up. <laughs> are we able to turn the camera on? Is that on? Uh, we're not seeing you, I'm afraid. Do you, 
do you want to kick off and just yep. no, I'll, I'll, I'll talk and let someone else yeah. um, sort out the technology right. um so so good good to be here this evening um and great to come after um Bradford in terms of making their point really really clearly as as Susan always does around I think the real opportunity for how we can deal with connectivity and capacity across the north I think this is so vitally important and I think in our response to all of this you really can't lose the ambition that we originally had around northern powerhouse rail and that real opportunity to connect nearly four million people within 90 minutes of four or more northern cities and I think that ambition remains to be absolutely vital um, and I would continue to make the case that you know the strategic argument we make for high speed two and I, IRP has to be framed within the key points around capacity connectivity and the ability to deliver for the future now, Manchester, I, I suppose, in, in current circumstance, we're in a situation where we may be deemed to be fortunate on the basis um, of, of what has been included. Um, and I think what I would say is if we really are to deliver on the benefits around economic growth, regeneration and connectivity that benefits the whole North, the case that Manchester and Greater Manchester is making at the moment around some specific concerns on high speed too, and how that might interact in the future and um, with any future additions that's added on to what's currently planned around um, rail connecting our towns and cities means that we have some, I think, really quite valid um, concerns. I think what we've been consistently clear about in the city is that rail improvements and investments in the north and in Manchester must be delivered in a way that complements the principles around placemaking, connectivity, local employment and sustainable growth that we focused our energies on for so long. And I suppose the, the point around thinking about the once in a generation investment and ensuring that we get it absolutely right is really vitally important. Because I think there are some current challenges at the moment with particularly looking at Manchester, um, some of the cases that we will be making through both the EAS process that's been outlined by colleagues at High Speed 2, but also through the, through the parliamentary petitioning process that makes the point that actually, in terms of our concerns at the moment, there remain some serious concerns around the original ambition of what we wanted to achieve through both the airport station, which, if you remember, was originally around to bring over 4 million people within 90 minutes reach of the airport through both High Speed 2 and NPR to unlock its benefits, but also really and fundamentally to get to the heart of that point around capacity and I think this is something that is fundamental so for me in terms of what's currently been proposed through high speed two we're proposing to build something quite some time in advance with a significant investment that will be full and at capacity on current levels at day one and I think there's some serious concerns there around allowing the opportunity for all of our cities to grow so I suppose what what I would reflect on is that I think, you know, where we need to be, not just in Greater Manchester, but across the North, is not to lose sight of the reasons that we came together initially to make that case. Because what we can't have is a circumstance where one area is pitted against another, one region's future prosperity is pitted against another region's future prosperity. And we really need to hold that line firmly. That actually what it is we're articulating, the benefits that we're talking about unlocking, aren't simply around moving one thing from London to Manchester or something from London to Leeds. It's around that rail point of properly connecting all of our towns and cities across the North. And what I would also then quickly just say is around not losing sight that, that rail isn't the only way that we will achieve that. Um, today, we had notification in Greater Manchester, for example, that the legal challenge brought by bus providers has, has failed in court so we can get on with bringing our buses back into public sector um, control and running, um, but also the points around active tra travel and making sure that we deal with the issues of cars and our roads. So we need to be joining all of this up together. I think there's a real opportunity to regroup and to reframe this through the context of the levelling up. Um, framework that's currently, I think, you know, doing its way through government in terms of thinking how it can be implemented. But let's not kid ourselves. We've been arguing for many of these things for such a long time. We've been through iterations of industrial strategies through to levelling up. 
And I think we need to maintain that solidarity across the North that doesn't pit ourselves against each other. And I think that's why it's great, particularly to follow Susan. We'll be continuing to support Bradford and the case that they make and connect them closer to our area. And we need to continue to do that and to expand that in the months and years to come. Thank you very much indeed, Bev. Uh, uh, that, 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 you know, I, I really think it's uh, good that, that you are actually taking into significant consideration those around you, not not just the, the population of Greater Manchester as well. So that's really, really appreciated. Moving swiftly on in that case, we now have Lord Ingledew, who's the, 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 the chair of the Cumbria Local Enterprise Partnership. Lord Ingledew, uh, Inglewood, I beg your pardon, so I'm terribly sorry. These glasses are terrible. I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer to anything or most things anyway, so <laughs> well, don't worry about that. I, I normally answer to how ye and gear said, but that yeah. was <laughs> loading um, In the context of a debate about um, particularly rail uh, transport across the north of England, it's probably fair to say that Cumbria is, is a bit different. But while that means that our perspective is not necessarily quite the same as others, I think it's worth emphasising right at the start that we are an integral part of the North. And as speaker after speaker has said, we need proper interconnectivity, not only with the South and the Midlands, but also across the rest of the North of England. And that includes, and it's important for things like our visitor economy, from uh, the, 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 the kind of the, the southern part of the northwest, if I can call it that way, and for that matter, uh, from the northeast as well. Um, but it's, 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 it is slightly different. But nevertheless, for general economic reasons, what happens there impacts on us. And I must confess, as an individual, and I think probably as a locality, we uh, would be reluctant in um, emphatically telling everybody what they ought to do. Now, the, from a rail transport perspective, we are, as I said, a, a, I think a little different in that the, our main arterial uh, rail line is the West Coast Main Line. And while I spent four more hours on it last weekend than I had anticipated when I started two journeys, nevertheless, compared to many places, it does provide a pretty decent service. And one of the curious uh, characteristics of the HS2 proposition is that, uh, that there is a risk that we're actually going to find our journey times to London reduce, sorry, get longer. Now, that is, um, as you can imagine, not something which we'd either expected or looked forward to. So we're going to fight very strongly about that. Now, recently, I did some travelling east-west uh, uh, from, from Redford to Manchester, and then again from Leeds to uh, near Lazenby. Uh, along the Settle Carlisle line as a passenger. And while the, the latter is marvellous as a tourist journey, it was a very long haul. And those are the kind of things that I think are important to our community to get east-west connections. And we've got the one over the Newcastle line uh, from Carlisle. And in particular, uh, there is the West Cumbria coastal route, which is very important. to, And it is very um old style in the sense it still has single track in places contrasted to many other parts of the country. That is crucial to, I think, opening up the economic development of the West in the longer run. But the problem about being a very big area with a very small population is that you don't actually necessarily immediately get to the top of the queue of those who are asking for public money. Having said all that, we have our own idiosyncratic problems and we also display solidarity with the rest of the North, because our good fortunes or bad fortunes depend to a very great extent on them. There is, however, one thing which uh, nobody gets touched on, and it is actually a, a very significant to us. And that is, look, instead of looking south, look, look north. And that is the links with Edinburgh and Glasgow. And I was very disappointed recently that the Scott and I sit on the Borderlands Economic Forum, uh, that the, uh, the, the recently published South of Scotland rail plan didn't put the borders rail link to Carlisle in as a priority. Re-establishing good rail links uh, north are as important to us as having good rail links south. And that's going to be the final thought for my remarks initially. Yeah. 
Thank you very much indeed, Lord Inglewood. Uh, and our, our last speaker on this second panel is uh, Councillor, Councillor Liam Robinson, who's the transport portfolio, portfolio holder on the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. So it's over to you, Liam, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Ian. Absolutely wonderful to be here, as everyone else has uh, said previously. You know, kind of, I don't think we should ever lose sight of how long we've been working together as a united north of England. We've been doing this for a very, very long time, right across geography and actually across political parties uh, as well. And I think it's important that we kind of keep focusing on maintaining that unity because we are, at the end of the day, 16 million people in the north of England. That's one quarter of the British population. You know, that's absolutely huge, that's massive, that's really powerful. So we need to kind of always maintain that kind of strong alliance that we've got in, in arguing for what our part of the country needs at the end of the day. I'm, I'm not going to repeat everything that other people have, uh, have said, uh, but I will kind of focus on a number of kind of key points that we in the Liverpool city region, just with everyone right across the north, think really do need to be kind of addressed on this topic. And Top of the pile is the integrated rail plan. Our, our strong view is that actually government needs to think again uh, on that. You know, kind of Henry earlier on was very polite when he said it was just a kind of a shopping list from government. He wasn't very clear what was going to be uh, delivered. I think that's an extremely polite way of putting it. If I'm being dead honest, I think there's a real risk that this country could repeat some of the mistakes of the Victorians and not actually develop the rail network that will kind of give us a seamless network to support our country and our economy for the next century and beyond. We could end up with a number of kind of uh, short term cost and network compromises. I think certainly from our perspective, one of the key sort of areas where government has to think again is on the requirement actually to deliver the full HS2 Y network, but crucially as well, TFN's preferred Northern Powerhouse Rail Network, which for the avoidance of doubt is a brand new line from Liverpool connecting through Warrington, the right station solution in central Manchester, into central Bradford and then on to Leeds and beyond. Because only that model will give us the necessary capacity uplift we really need across the north. You know, if I zoomed in on the Liverpool city region, for example, we've got grave fears that because what's proposed is going to utilise old infrastructure uh, and only upgrade that, is we will end up with significant disruption during the construction phase, six years of kind of significant disruption that will give us an economic hit of 280 million pounds during that period of time. But we'll also end up with long-term compromises, a number of local passenger services to, to key regional centres like St. Helens, like Runcorn, the ability to expand services into Wales North and South, that's our kind of, a key part of our economic hinterland will be uh, compromised and lost. But probably more concerning, not just for the whole of the North of England, but for the whole of the UK, is actually the impact on freight and particularly the Port of Liverpool. Because we have to remember that the Port of Liverpool is the main and largest west-facing port for the British mainland. And one of the things that our team's been able to analyse is that we run the risk of losing 88 freight trains a week during the kind of build phase of what the government is proposing on the integrated rail plan. That's, you know, frankly, an economic heart attack to the, logis the logistics and freight industry, not just for our city region, but for the whole of the north of England. So we think there's a huge requirement for government to think again. And I suppose, I want to be optimistic about it, in our meetings with government, it's been heartening that they've been prepared to admit that perhaps not all the evidence has been properly evaluated and the door needs to be open to look at that uh, in a bit more of a thorough approach, because we only get one chance with this. You know, this genuinely is about delivering the right infrastructure requirements for our country for the next century uh, and beyond. And equally, as we have been right across the north, we have it be part of the solution of how we pay for that. You know, kind of the fact that we've advanced the offer to look at things like um, how we can capture land value uh, uplifts as part of the way that we can help pay for some of this infrastructure over the long term. We're more than happy as the north of England to look at those models of how we can contribute in a similar way that London's been able to help fund things like Crossroad, which are you know, necessary infrastructure for them. I think the kind of two points that I'd make is that, yes, we need to kind of focus on the long term infrastructure solution. We really need to think about how we build back public transport through the, you know, the post pandemic era. Um, one of the things that kind of really concerns us is, yes, let's focus on the long term infrastructure that will be with us in 15, 20, 30 years time. But we actually need to make sure 
that we're kind of building back the service in the short term if we're to avoid that car led recovery which would be a disaster for our kind of uh, tackle with the climate emergency but crucially would also hinder our economic recovery and with a lot of the mood music coming out of treasury about how the rail network across this country could be looking at a 10 15 or 20 percent reduction of funding that would be madness economically, but also madness in terms of how we actually move people sustainably across the country, but particularly within the north of England. So that really needs to be kind of uh, addressed. And I suppose to put it in an international context, earlier this week, I was discussing with an opposite number in Stockholm, their approach to building back from the pandemic. And one of the things they're focusing on is no reduction in services because they see it's absolutely vital to maintain that supply to build that demand back for the for the long term and support their economic recovery. I think the final point I'd make though is the importance of devolution in all of this. Yeah, it's absolutely vital we're focusing on the connections right across the north and in and out of the north, but there's a huge role for local transport in local areas. As Bev mentioned, I think we're all delighted that Andy and everyone across Greater Manchester won that legal challenge to, to re-regulate their buses in Greater Manchester. And we're not that far behind in the Liverpool city region. Yeah, we've nailed our colours to the mast that bus franchise and re-regulating our network is the right way to give us that London style um, model. I think actually all areas of the North need the powers to do that because it's only mayoral areas that currently have access to that. And the legislation needs simplifying so it doesn't take as long uh, as it's taking Greater Manchester and it's taking ourselves in the Liverpool city region. But equally, we do need to have a proper conversation with government about what the right seed funding is to get it off the ground. You know, London's been uh, very successful in the fact that it's had the right sort of amount of financial support over the years. We need exactly the same uh, allocations through things like bus service improvement plans that we've all put ambitious bids in to actually get proper integrated transport network off the ground in our city regions and county county regions to actually give us that proper connectivity for all of our local economy. So those are the points that I'd kind of uh, make, but you know, really looking forward to the debate and discussion that's going to follow. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Liam. That, that, that's great. And we, we, we now move on. We're looking particularly in the first instance for contributions from um, uh, uh, parliamentarians and, 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 and senior local authority uh, 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 co contributors, please. Um, is, is, does anyone want to come in and add to the discussion at, at this point? Kate Green, please. Lovely to see you, Kate. I, I, hope, I hope to see you in a moment, but... Uh... Oh, well, I'm certainly here. All right, that's right. Well, um, I can certainly hear you, Kate, so carry on. Oh, you don't need to look at me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, thank you very much. Um, I feel we've been having these discussions for all the time that you and I have been in Parliament, Ian, that we've always had a big and bold ambition for um, the rail network in the north. We've always been ambitious for HS2, for east-west connectivity, for the ability to link um, all the cities of our region and the communities of our region and to look both south and north um, in terms of transport links out of the region to other parts of the UK. And it is really depressing and disappointing that our vision and our ambition has now not been matched by the vision and ambition of government. And I think one of the things we have to recognise is that the north must speak with one voice on this. Um, and that's got to be cross party, cross our different cities, our different um, regions and um, counties and boroughs of the north. That This is important to all of our region, but actually this is important to the whole country. If the government believes in its levelling up agenda that our, our region does well. Um, I also think that I absolutely agree with Liam. We're, we're talking about a network for the, for the short term and we need to get that right, that right and for the next 200 years. And I, I suppose my question to panellists is to ask about how we can build in some flexibility so that uh, certainly if you think about the, the huge changes that the pandemic may have brought permanently to the way that we live our lives, more homeworking, more use of technology and so on. Um, I think I'd be really interested in panellists thoughts on how we can be adaptable and flexible um, as we design you know, heavy infrastructure um, that's meant to last for, for the long term as well as thinking about the short term solutions we need now. Um, and then the other thing I think is really, really important and was alluded to by a number of panellists is that infrastructure without investment in human capital, in schools, in communities, in town centres, in families, 
um, in our cultural and sporting network so that people have um, strong reasons to be making journeys within and, and beyond our region. I think um, we really need to locate what we want to do with infrastructure in terms of our wider social and economic ambitions um, so that we've got a big story to tell um, that really touches people's lives. Thank you very much indeed, Kate. Bev, did, did you want to come back in at this point? Because I understand that you have to go quite soon, is that right, Bev Craig? Um, yes, and I think you can can now see me. So, so that's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at it. Um, I mean, I mean, I think all of those points that that Kate makes are really important. I think the thing that I would sort of flag from from our perspective is being being quite clear in pushing back on some of those short term decisions that have been made now around the prioritisation of particular services. Um, so anyone that's ever had the joy of travelling through Platform 13 or Manchester probably knows where I'm coming from on this. Um, but what was really interesting um, as a consequence of the pandemic is that we were actually seeing more people coming into our city centre at the weekends than um, had previously been pre-pandemic. Pre but where was the choices made to reduce services? They were made at the weekends. Yeah. So I think it's looking at some of our short-term trends, sharing that, but also having the appropriate avenue, I think, to be able to push back on that when it comes to some of these decisions, because I think they're really important. Um, and, and totally, totally would echo the point around investing in things that aren't just infrastructure. Um, we can have fantastic trains um, without in investing in, in the people that will obviously be a vital part of that economy, then it's simply not, not worth doing at all. So, so would strongly echo those points and apologies that I've got to shoot off a little bit early. Okay, Bev, thank you very much. We also have a, um, a request for a contribution from Gina Dowding, who I believe is from Lancaster. Gina? Hi, thanks very much. I um, don't know how to put my camera on. Uh, yes, I'm a city councillor in Lancaster and a county councillor on Lancashire County Council. So I just, my question really is, um, I can see how it's so much easier to get everyone behind the, the intercity connections. Um, and yet, um, as I've posted and a few other people have posted and Lord Ingle would make the point, you know, there's lots of really essential improvements required between some of our smaller towns in the north. And I'm just wondering if we accept that those are necessary, but how do we get everybody behind those? Because obviously it's easier, say, for... Leeds, Manchester, Liverpool to be arguing for the, the really big, bigger infrastructure projects. Um, and yet these other things are really absolutely essential if we're really going to see the benefits for, you know, the social benefits and, and link up uh, training, education, um, you know, jobs opportunities and not see things sucked down to or sucked out into the bigger cities. So it's, it's a question of like governance and organisation. How can Transport for the North and these org organisations really help boost the case for the counties and the smaller towns? Thanks. Thanks very much, Gina. H Henry, you want to come back? And then, and then Susan, please. Henry? I think, I mean, my, my, I think that's a really well-made point, but of course, the transport plan which Martin's team developed included not just Northern Powerhouse Rail, but those wider connections. And I think We've obviously talked a lot about Northern Powerhouse Rail today and HS2, but it's really interesting if you work out what the displaced capacity would have meant. So if you want to improve a lot of those local journeys, including the rail network, and the North East is a good example of that because of the Leamside line, mm -hmm. there was a very strong alignment, Gina, between a lot of those cases for improving local connectivity and major infrastructure. Because certainly if you want to use the railway, the problem is there isn't any capacity in the North. And that doesn't just mean that we can't get faster journeys or freight. It also means we can't get a lot of those local service improvements. Yes. One of the issues with the, the government's reopening your railways plan is that a lot of those schemes are predicated on opening stations where there's no service because there's no capacity to run a train to those new stations. And so you, you can't, I don't think, argue abstractly for local connectivity without understanding in many cases that actually new lines is, a, is an important part of that. And the congestion on the rail network is a significant reason why many local improvements and services can't be delivered. Um, and we haven't been, I don't think, clear enough about saying that one of the consequences of the IRP is actually that lots of other local improvement schemes that were predicated on displaced capacity are now no longer going to go ahead. It's not just the new services and improved services to say Lancashire, uh, which are protected largely, 
um, or to Cumbria, which are protected largely, but the network is, is integrated. So what you will see is that lead station and lead station congestion directly affects how many services you can run to Lancaster on the lines between Lancashire and West Yorkshire. And you will now see less services running between say Lancaster and local towns and villages in the direction of Keithley and Skipton, because there's nowhere to put the train when it gets to Leeds. And that we haven't, we haven't often been really clear enough that if you don't have capacity in the major rail hubs, everybody loses, not just the people who live in the, in the proximity of that particular hub. Thanks, Henry. Can I just come back on one, just a small detail on that one in terms of the West Coast main line? I don't think we have the same capacity issues north of Warrington. And in fact, what we have, and I did flag this up in, in the uh, chat, as um, Lord Inglewood said, we have this ridiculous situation where we might actually lose our direct London services. Um, and some of the other things, um, you know, if once HS2 comes online because, the, because of the speed issue, um, but also some of the things, the cross country, um, you're right to maybe to the Leeds, the Skipton lead service, but some of the other issues in Lancaster, Lancashire, East West aren't so affected by the major hubs, just to make that point, you know, they're not, they're not all go, still going to the major cities. Thanks, Gina. I've got a cue now, but I think Henry's contribution provided a good segue to Councillor Helen Hayden, who's the exec member for infrastructure and, uh, and climate at Leeds City Council. So, Helen, could you come in, please? Thank you. I don't know if you can see me, but... I can um, hear you, Helen. That's yeah, the important lovely. thing. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's an interesting experience. Um, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about, because there's been a lot mentioned. And um, I've um, I've had um, Baroness Blake um, on, the, uh, on the WhatsApp, um, because we're left in Yorkshire, and I think... Um, um, Susan said it very well about there is just a hole in the in the government's plans and what they're going to do about this connectivity. But and the IRP was supposed to be about customer experience as well. And I'm just reflecting on a couple of weeks ago, I went to Danby in North Yorkshire and I decided to go by train. And um, and the two hours I spent in Middlesbrough because there wasn't a train um uh, there wasn't um, a train driver. Um, I re did reflect that I could have been by the pool by now in Spain um, in the five hours that it took me to get to Danby um, and it would have taken me an hour and a half in the car. Um, it's um, And then on the way back, I boarded the train and it's been talked about that, um, that East Coast main line. And um, I've got a lot of family, half my family are in County Durham. Um, and um, I joined at Darlington and um, the train was so full that they couldn't serve tea, teas and coffees. Um, and there was a, a, young, a, a young woman who was in a complete state of distress because she couldn't find anywhere to stand or to, um, uh, and a, a pa another passenger had sworn at her. And so myself and another lady who had been standing from Newcastle all the way and probably did so all the way to London, um, we managed to calm her down um, and um, got to talking about other things. Um, and, and that is a capacity issue. There's no, so they stopped people boarding at Leeds and I noticed another train was going from Leeds. And, and that's the problem with our station. Um, uh, in Leeds and its capacity issues and the fact that it's a bottleneck. And um, in October two, 2021, Leeds station passenger numbers were on average 101% of the passenger numbers pre-COVID in October 2019. And as Bev said, actually the weekend, we were seeing 150%. Um, so we really don't want that, um, it, it's all changing. But that extra capacity that we desperately needed, it was, HS2 was never about um, you know, getting to London more quickly. Um, and uh, having studied in Birmingham, it would have been lovely to get to Birmingham more quickly. But it's, um, it, it's about that capacity that opens up and as Bev talked about connecting people and allowing people to travel about and see each other and opening up those economic opportunities, I think it's been sorely missed and you can probably sense the frustration in my voice, but thank you for letting me contribute. I really appreciate Thanks, it. I, I, now, just, just to let, let people know, I've got a queue. So I've got Susan Hinchcliffe and then I've got um, Lord Inglewood and then Toba News. So Susan Hinchcliffe, please. Yeah, I mean, I think we've said it, haven't we? The, the network is full as it is. 
So we need to transport revolution, but what we've got really is sticking plaster. And revolution means new lines, actually, because otherwise you are going to speed through on um, some of these new um, uh, modifications of existing lines and go past smaller places that are going to lose out. Uh, and when it comes to, I mean, Liam mentioned it in his presentation, you know, the bus model is broken and that needs to be improved. Um, we've depended a lot in West Yorkshire on heavy rail to do intra uh, town connectivity. Um, we need mass transit and really pleased that we are looking forward to that now, although we're at very early stages. So it needs all these levels of connectivity for a place to work. Uh, and it's horses for courses, really. But we're so lacking the fundamental building blocks of our transport infrastructure that it's going to take us a long time to get there. I'd like a bit of revolution on trains. <laughs> Thank you very much. Lord Inglewood, please. You're on mute, uh, Lord Inglewood. I beg your pardon. Sorry. So, not at all. As I was listening to that discussion, I was thinking to myself, well, yes, the first thing is we've got to be clever and think carefully about exactly what it is we're asked for and what are the reasons for it and how it, it connects with other things. Secondly, on the one hand, we must all stick together and we must be cooperative and friendly, but at the same time, we've got to be capable of and occasionally be very difficult. The next thing in the context of something quite different, somebody said to me, the key to his success was that he never gave up and what he achieved, he got 25 years after he started, so we mustn't give up. And the third possibility is one which isn't very often achievable, but it happened for Penrith Station because Willie Whitelaw, the Deputy Prime Minister, used to get on and off there. And the railway authorities realised there was no point in trying to close it down, even if they wanted to, because he wouldn't let them. So get the Deputy Prime Minister to live where the station you want to keep open remains. <laughs> Thank you very much. Torben, please. I just wanted to pick up the point that the MP for Lancaster made, not just because I'm a Lancaster lad and I felt duty bound to uh, come in and respond to it. Um, but the, the, the wider point that has been made by various comments made in the chat as well is about integration. I think, yeah, this session is focusing on the integrated rail plan and quite rightly so. But really what we need is economies that function. We need kids that can get to the right um, university or further education course at a price they can afford. We need cycle lanes that take um, people away, uh, take, take people away from danger when they're cycling on the roads. And all of these things need to be considered together. Um, councils do that, combined authorities do that. And we need the government really to help us, I think, integrate our plans more rather than having modes um, competing with each other. Yes, of course, there's a place for long distance coaches. Absolutely there is, um, but not in isolation and not as a way of competing with uh, rail services that can provide greater capacity, but rail services will never go everywhere at all times. Coaches can add lots to that debate. So um, as somebody who works in one of the bigger city regions um, in the country, I just think, I, and I do see it time and again in some of the smaller towns um, across the region, we need the powers and we need the assistance to actually come up with more integrated plans that get it all together. Because the reality is, 70% odd of trips anywhere are taken by car, not on foot, uh, by car. Um, and, and we need to make sure that our areas can thrive healthily. People can be physically active. People can go and do the right social, economic, and educational activities for them, but on the right form of travel so that it's all planned together. Thanks, Torben. Um, we, we've got Ali Bell from National Express, Nina Smith from Real Future Yorkshire, and um, Councillor Mary Sturzeger from Wire Council. So, um, Ali Bell, please. Hi, thanks, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Thank you oh, very excellent. much. Excellent. Uh, yes. So, as National Express is the people that uh, run most of the coaches, um, picking up on what Tobin was saying, actually, is that is there a place at the moment coming back from the pandemic when I understand, you know, the capacity of coaches is a lot less than trains. And obviously, Councillor Robinson was talking about freight. We can't help with that. But at the moment, is there a place for us to sit down with you guys and look at what coach could provide while you are waiting for these bits of the railway to be built or you know rebuilt or brought back into service because I think you know looking at the restoring your railway um, scheme you know for the £50,000 that they've been given to do a feasibility study on each of these uh, the bids that were successful 
honestly, you could you could use that money to have an hourly service from from some of the places that you've been talking about, maybe in Cumbria. So it's not it's as Tobin was saying, it's not competing with it. But, you know, in return, we would uh, we could do things like, you know, we could share the passenger data to share where the demand is you would kind of brand it as part of the railway you could start building that demand uh, so that you knew what was what was kind of to feed into your feasibility for your railway and to start building that so that when the railway is built then we would either you know move on step back or or even run it alongside for people that you know we run very successfully from say Birmingham to London there's two train lines from Birmingham to London but we also run an awful lot of coaches because some people coach is the right thing for them it's it's a lot cheaper it takes longer but that's their that's their choice so I'm just here to offer to to kind of is it time to start that conversation and just give people an option while you're waiting for a railway to be sorted out which obviously takes a lot of time because it's heavy rail and it's infrastructure. Thank you very much indeed Ali. Um, uh, Nina Smith from Rail Free Future Yorkshire please. Nina. Yes, thanks, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah, indeed. Good. OK, um, can I just, just stress a few quick points? I mean, the first of which, we've heard a lot about city to city, but what's really important is getting into the city or indeed the larger towns, the employment centres from where you live. Uh, and that's about building capacity so that more trains can serve the, the local stations. And that capacity can only be generated by new lines. So uh, for that reason alone, I mean, we need the uh, NPR, <clears throat> the new line between Leeds and Manchester, and we need the whole NPR network as Transport for the North has put forward. <clears throat> we also desperately need a lot more freight capacity. And, and I mean, the very welcome Transpennine upgrade proposals, long overdue, but very welcome, um, I think only allow for one freight train an hour. Now, if we're really going to sort of get freight onto the railways, off the roads, we're going to need a new freight train across the Pennines, possibly using the, 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 the Woodhead alignment. Um, the fourth point I'd make is electrification. I'm not sure whether anybody mentioned it. I came into this a little late. Um, but we need a massive rolling programme of electrification, not just because it provides actually faster and smoother and cleaner trains, but it's vital for the, cli for the climate agenda. It also, given what's happening in Ukraine, um, if we're losing our dependence on getting oil from, from, from Russia, um, it's going to be, we, we, it becomes ever more important that we use less oil and use more um, renewable resources. And finally, just to mention the elephant in the room, of course, and all this is Her Majesty's Treasury, which, in my view, sort of, you know, knows the uh, price of everything and the value of very little. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, right. Uh, Mary Sturzik, a councillor from um, uh, Wyatt, Wyatt Council, please. Mary. Hi, can you hear me? Indeed, thank you very uh, much. No, thanks for inviting me. Um, I feel very privileged to be here. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is regarding the tra whether Transport for the North is supporting the reopening of the Fleetwood Line, which was closed in 1966 after Beeching slapped it on us. Um, and the other one is the accessibility. As a disabled woman, I have I cannot get the train from Polton because I use a scooter and I'm only allowed to take it if I can carry it myself. And um, that's down to Northern Rail. And so I am literally reliant on my car and I feel guilty whenever I use my car by myself because of the damage I'm doing to the environment. So we need these trains. My son had to go to, uni he went to university in Ormskirk. He had to leave at 5 a.m catch a bus to one place, walk for a mile to the train station, get another bus from the train station because of the upgrade to electrification, just to get to university for nine o'clock in the morning. There isn't even a sixth form in Fleetwood. We have no sixth form, so the children leave school at 16 have to go to another town. Then they have to, if they want to go on to university, they, they, they've no access from Fleetwood, they have to go either to Blackpool or Polton. Uh, the trams take 40 minutes. A study was done by Kat Smith, the MP for Fleetwood, and she found out that it was quicker to go to Geneva from Lancaster than it is to get 
on public transport than it is to get from Fleetwood to Westminster. It's just appalling. That's by, via public transport, which is what we should all be using now with the um, climate emergency. It's, um, I cannot believe that the government has let Fleetwood lie since the early 70s when the port closed, well, not fully closed, but died off with the fishing. And they've just seemed to have forgotten Fleetwood exists. And the it's train's right. coming back. Can I ask you to be brief, Mary, please? I'm sorry. Yes, sorry. Can I ask you to be brief, on. please? Yeah. Okay, th thank you very much. I I've got one more. Someone else has indicated. Hans Mundry, please. I'm muted now. Right, thank you. Thanks Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, I think, look, looking, looking at what everybody else is saying, I think the lack of, in lack of investment in infrastructure is going to be, has been a problem that's been holding the North back for some time. We sort of have promises that it's going to change now and, and we've got to make sure we make the right changes going forward. And it's the, I've just got to say one, is, one instance, we've got a new station in Warrington and we've got passengers that are, aren't getting on train because the trains are coming, leaving full and no room for them. And they've heard the timetable because it, uh, what we worked out is the infrastructure should have been changed with the turnbacks 10, 12 years ago. Didn't happen. There's some sort of vague promise it may happen sometime in the future, but 12 years on, it's still not happened. Now we've got the, the timetabling problem, so there's not enough room on the track for the trains that's needed to serve the populations of both Liverpool, Manchester and through Warrington. The turnbacks will solve the problem for them. What I'm worried about going forward is we're going through the same situations coming forward where we get a make do amend approach using existing tracks and a new track and investment infrastructure isn't happening and we're going to, we're building up a problem for the future where we've got the same situation where we're going to have freight build up passenger build up and then timetable situations to say that we can't get enough trains on the tracks that we've got we've got available and when we're going to wake up and say actually it's it's not it's not uh, something we need, not something we want to do, but the fact is the funding is needed there to actually put the infrastructure that's needed. We can't get away from the point is we're under investing in, in, in the needs of the north. Thanks, Hans. Uh, right, I, I do need to bring our panellists back in and can I thank everyone for their contributions so far. Um, Susan, anything quickly to add, please? No, I think it's just shown this session, isn't it, that there's massive unmet demand uh, need across the north and we really need to keep together and work to prevent a positive prospectus of the opportunity in the north because poverty is expensive and if we don't connect places, there's going to be more poverty and that's going to cost the government money. So just reflecting that Richard Sunak actually is a Yorkshire MP and I'm afraid that didn't do us ever much good, but we need to keep working on him. Um, Henry, anything from you, please? I mean, I think, I think it's been a great discussion and I think the key point is to maintain the evidence base and the economic case because I think that the challenge, Ian, is that, that there isn't a logic for just getting us what we need or deserve. Does that make sense? Unless we can demonstrate the economic return, not just for the north of England, but the wider country. Um, and that, as much as we might feel we've been treated badly and poorly, we've got to focus on that economic case going forward and not, not let that go away. Okay, thanks. Liam, anything to add from your perspective? Well, I agree with everything that... Um, chicken, that, pasta, cheese and uh, tomato sauce, cheese. Ma Mary, um, Mary, put yourself on mute, please, thank you. Right. Okay. I thought it's probably more kind of enlightening than what I was going to about say, actually. But, um, <laughs> but, but all joking apart, I think Henry's hit the nail on the head. I think the other point I'd make listening to the contributions from Mary and from, from Mina, for example, around things about electrification and, uh, and accessibility, just how, how kind of entrepreneurial we can be in a devolved setting. You know, kind of, we haven't got the time and not going to bore people, but the brand new fleet of trains that we're buying in the Liverpool city region will be the first in the country to have level access from the train to the platform. So that shows how we've been able to innovate. The whole fleet is also going to have batteries on so we can extend the fleet, uh, extend the service beyond where electrification is, but do it in a net zero way. So my point being is there's great learning in the North, how if government gives us the power, and then follows up with the money, we can actually get on with it and deliver it ourselves in a way that works, not just for the North, but actually can set the standard for the whole of the country. Martin, anything from you, please? I would just build on, um, again, it's been a fascinating conversation. I would just build on the point that Henry was making. It's not just about the economic, it's about making sure our arguments are based in terms of 
the evidence, how it addresses social issues, how it addresses the environment, and how it gives that total package. And I think that's where we have to be smarter at demonstrating how you need to see investment in transport as delivering multiple outcomes, outcomes that are important both nationally, regionally and locally. Uh, and that's where I think we need to strengthen it. We need to continue to focus on that because the power of that argument will be the basis for making the case for investment, whether it's public or private sector. Thanks. And any, Lord Ingle, Ingle, would anything from you, please? Quickly, I, I concur with what Martin and Henry have said. Um, and I just think it's worth always keeping in mind that there are other people who will feel equally strongly about their claims on public money for this kind of thing. So we must see our own problems in realistic perspective, possibly worth looking at what they're doing, see if they've got any good ideas. And secondly, for better or worse, we've got to recognise the country's running out of money. Great. Corbyn, uh, last word from you, please. Yeah, absolutely. Tran transport is about people. Uh, it's about what it does to make them healthy, about what it does for them to earn a living, about how it connects them with uh, all the opportunities and the things that they need to do in life. So as long as we maintain that narrative and transport for the North and the Northern powerhouse have helped us to find that narrative in the North, we need to keep on going back again and again to making the case in those terms. Thanks, Torben. And, and, and lastly, from, from, from me, uh, can I thank all of the contributors uh, this afternoon and, and for the organisers for, for, for putting this to the, together, the Greater Manchester Westminster Group. And, 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 and as a local politician here in the northeast of England, what I would be saying to everyone is be ambitious, don't be fobbed off and don't accept per head funding formula because per head funding formula will never comp compensate us for the decades of underinvestment that we've had to endure. So we've got to be asking for a real special case. And while I understand Henry and others saying, you know, we've got to be entrepreneurial like London, well, London has a number of advantages. It's got economies of scale, and it's also got the treasury on its doorstep. And people in the treasury like to get to and from work quite easily. So that they've got that advantage. And, and I really don't think we should be um, adopted. And by that. So, look, everyone, it's been a real pleasure to chair this today. Can I thank you all very much indeed for coming along? And I hope to see you all again soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you.